Hi, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so fresh from kind of, uh, you know, a Yorkshire dairy farm, smelling just slightly sweeter than uh, they did earlier. Um, delighted to kind of uh, to, to return and kind of join, obviously, proceedings here at the Biotech Centre. Um, so this is the ultimate in singing for your supper, I think, because um, the kind of the, the final session of today is also very much a lead into tomorrow and is a really important keynote for the whole conference. Um, really delighted to welcome Nick Friggins, who's senior researcher at INRAE, so the Agritech Institute uh, in France. INRAE is a really important organisation with you know, lots of R&D and lots of extension work uh, throughout the sector in France. And uh, Nick has kind of got... Um, basically kind of foot in lots of different camps with kind of a sort of British family and French family. So, uh, you know, true, true European. Uh, I was in Barnsley last night, you know, living the dream. So, um, so it's great to welcome Nick here today. And, and essentially Nick's um, going to look at the whole concept of precision livestock farming. Uh, he's got a really illustrious pedigree working in the Agritech Centre, really looking at both how to use data how to look at sensors, the whole aspects of animal science and applying the knowledge that we've got to sustainable uh, food production. Big aspects of nutrition, um, but also Nick's here today as the senior researcher, but also lead for a really important consortium of work. So the Gentor programme, which we've been discussing a bit on farm today, is really looking at some key aspects of breeding and managing for resilience and efficiency in the face of climate change across the European cattle population. So dairy and beef, looking at how we combine genomics with key precision streams of data and looking at how within different systems we can make the right decisions for the future, basically of dairy and beef cows. That's partly why uh, we're linked up um, with this today and RAFT is part of that consortium um, along with about another 12 countries and 20 other partners. That's now four years into a five-year piece of work and is already kind of making really groundbreaking um, bits of research and looking at how we're going to apply those to the future. So I'm really pleased that Nick's going to share, um, share his kind of thoughts about how we apply these different aspects of precision farming and look to how we're going to apply them because it's really about how we make a difference to how we produce food and how we interact with climate change factors. So I'm going to hand over to Nick. Um, I, I think we've got some time for Q&A at the end, so uh, I'm going to take a seat. Um, there are one or two important questions that we're going to look at. Least of all, how the bus beat us back, because basically we set off from the farm in front of the bus and arrived two minutes after, and I, I'm still not quite sure how that happened. Um, yeah, OK. okay. I'm going to sit down now. <laughs> Let's carry on. I, I thought we went the most direct route. But anyway, enough said. Nick, thank you very much. Delighted to kind of hand over to Nick now. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, OK. Uh, what do I do to get the slides? I press the green one, perhaps. Yep. OK, good. Um, so before we start, there were a couple of things I wanted to, to share with you. Um, so a little bit of anxiety for this kind of talk because, you know, you're not quite sure what your audience is going to be and you're really digging into people's drinking time and people have been talking about this all day, what do you do? And then yesterday at 6 o'clock I turned on the BBC News and I saw Boris Johnson, quite frankly, making a dog's breakfast out of a talk and I thought, OK, there's no pressure anymore. <laughs> I can't do worse than that. The other thing I wanted to share with you was um, it's nice to be back in Yorkshire. I don't get back here very often. But a lot of the work that's being presented here is part of a scientific journey, which actually started down the road, Leeds University, where I, I did my degree, um, and then moved on from there. So it's, it's nice to make that link. So. As Jonathan said, I work in the French National Research Institute called INRAE. They didn't think how that would sound in English. 
uh, when they chose the name. And I'll tell you a little bit about that and this unit. I've also put on here uh, the equivalent institution in Denmark, which is now called Aarhus University, because I was there for quite a long time and some of the work that I'm showing today was, was done there, so I wanted to just credit them. And Jonathan gave me this talk about the concept of precision livestock farming. I'm not really thrilled about that. I'd quite rather talk about the potential of precision livestock farming. So just keep that in mind as we go through. So the unit I'm in is called Mozach, which in French stands for Systemic Modeling Applied to Ruminants. And you can see from the end that our experimental animal is the dairy goat. Uh, but we do models in all kinds of things. So what we're about is taking data and knowledge and trying to predict from that. And we have a whole range of models. We have things like this, which can predict very detailed physiological reproductive hormone data, for example. Um, we've also done things uh, looking at how animals respond to challenges. So if you put them in stressful conditions, can we predict which will respond the most and which the less? This was in trout. We do things on much longer time scales as well. So these are uh, models that predict what will happen after 40 generations of selection with different kind of breeding goals in different farming environments. And we also do things uh, to do with precision livestock farming. And I've put up here this thing called Herd Navigator. Um, and that is a piece of work that I was heavily involved in the development of that system. But I would just make it very clear that we were involved in the science. We were not at all involved or are no longer involved in anything to do with the commercial aspects. So I'll use examples from Herd Navigator, but simply as an illustration. I'm not trying to sell anything or gaining any benefit from them. <laughs> and then, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, I'm leading this project called Gentor, and we'll talk about that at the end. So what I want to talk about is the perspectives that on-farm technology can offer us. I think there are huge opportunities. There are some pitfalls as well. Take a few examples uh, from reproduction and mastitis. And then, at the end, talk a little bit about some of the more complex traits that we could begin to get at. So all of this is really the start, and there is a future to come, and it's coming fast. So the key thing, and we covered this today uh, on the farm with these technologies, is the frequent measurements. It's the fact that we get repeated measurements. And that's really every single time we look at what we can do with these data is the fact that we have repeated measurements. They're often in real time, which is quite helpful. And if they're automated systems, that tends to give us a, a standard reliability and can sometimes give us an improved accuracy. And what that means is that instead of being on farm, seeing what's happening today, making a judgment on the present, a snapshot, we actually can have profiles. We can have the whole film, or at least the bit of the film that we've already seen. We can see where an animal has come from. And that is the second thing which I think is a key element of these technologies. We have the history, and that's really, really important. If they're real time, then obviously rapid reaction is something which we can look at and is important. And I think that these data streams also give us added value in interpretation. And I'll try and go through some examples that show that. What we don't want to see, and the challenge with all of these things, is this. We can generate huge amounts of data. We can have things that are measured on a second-by-second -second basis. But quite frankly, that's no use to anybody until it has been processed, until it has been filtered and smoothed, distilled. I think it's also worth going back and sort of thinking where we were before we had some of these technologies. We're beginning to get used to them being there. But if we take this example for a single cow, and these are days from carving along the bottom, the red arrows here indicate that this cow was inseminated at these time points by the farmer. He saw some signs of estrus. Those are the, uh, the pink triangles. But basically, a lot of the time, he has no idea what's going on. You can't easily look inside the animal and see what's going on, unless you have some kind of precision livestock technology. 
And then you can fill a lot more of that space. So this is an example of progesterone monitoring. These are measurements made frequently, automatically. And we can begin to see these patterns here. And these dips in progesterone, these are when the cow is in heat. This is when estrus is happening. So clearly there's a lot more information on that. The blue dots that are all over the place, they are the raw measurements. The blue line is the first part of that distilling. That is the smoothing, the filtering and smoothing of the data. So that's another key point. We can have lots and lots of data, but in order for it to be useful, it has to be filtered, it has to be smoothed, and then interpretation. So the filtering and smoothing, that's generally statistics, biometric models, and the interpretation, that's where we bring in the biology or the physiology. Here's another example of one of these progesterone profiles for an individual cow. So this is purely showing the, the statistical part, and then we can add the symbols onto the graph which represent the interpretation. So in this situation, we have three classes. We say at the beginning, the animal is flatlining. That's called postpartum anestrus, and those are the black crosses. As soon as the progesterone comes up, then she's estrus cycling. Those are the red stars. These dips down here are estrus. So this is the time where if you inseminated the animal, she could potentially be pregnant, and that's the third symbol the green diamonds. So I'm very deliberately not showing you outputs from a decision support system. I'm showing you the graphs behind. But all we're doing is taking these raw data, dragging a line through them, which is sensible, and then coding that line to say, what is the animal doing? And obviously then the, the decision support system would flag up this cow's in estrus at this time, or at this time, or at this time, and so on. So it's really not rocket science. But it can take us to better diagnostics. So again, if we go back and consider the situation where the farmer doesn't have these kinds of systems, he may have seen an estrus here around about, let's say, day 20 for this particular cow. So he's already expecting to see another estrus at day 42, day somewhere around there. But let's say he doesn't see that estrus. Now that could be for a variety of reasons, but he knows that one of the main reasons would be perhaps he missed that estrus, or the animal didn't express it very well. So he's probably not going to take any action straight away. He's going to wait another 20, 22 days. Yep, somewhere around about day 65. And then if he hasn't seen estrus again, he'll start to say, well, okay, I've missed, I, what's the chances I missed it twice and what's the chances there's really a problem? So maybe now I call the vet a few days later. But again, if you had that film and not just the snapshot, it would be very clear already around day 40 that there was no dip in progesterone, that this cow, he hadn't missed estrus, she hadn't had an estrus, she had a problem. She had a prolonged luteal phase, and that's typically a, um, an ovarian cyst. Sorry, a follic Yes, an ovarian cyst. A luteal cyst. I'll get right in the end of it. And with that information, he could call out earlier. Saves time. It also gives considerably more information to the person who's trying to diagnose the animal, because they can rule out a number of things based on the shape of this progesterone profile. So these are very easy advantages of these kinds of systems. We can take another example uh, with mastitis. And I'm going to show you that we can get some early detection. But that also creates opportunities. So here is a similar kind of profile that I showed you before, but this time for mastitis. It's an indicator called LDH. It doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, and again, the blue dots are the raw data, and the blue line is the smooth data. And in the system which is using this, 
This is converted into a risk value. What is the risk that the cow is likely to have mastitis? And you can see that this risk increases here and is at high levels, roughly corresponding with that peak, and drops off again. And the interesting thing in this particular example, the red dot is the farmer calling the vet to treat for mastitis. He didn't have this information, so this is a situation where we were testing the system. He didn't see these graphs, so he independently called the cow, uh, the cow. He independently called the farmer, independently called the vet, we're going to get there in the end, um, to, to treat, and you can see the system actually detected this a little bit earlier. So, early detection. What's interesting in that last graph, and we'll just go back, is that we can see this thing beginning to increase way before the actual treatment and then decreasing again. And I think that's something which is another potential opportunity with these kinds of measures. We, don't, we can move away from the idea of black and white, sick and healthy. We can actually look at all the, all the shades in between. So instead of talking about cows being clinically sick or healthy, we can actually talk about them being degrees of sick or degrees of infected. And we can see in that previous graph that thing gradually increasing. And then we can decide at what point we want to flag it up, maybe have some kind of threshold where it comes onto an alarm list. And that changes the perspective. So we move away from these binary things we start to think about the degree of illness or the degree of infection, which is on a continuous scale. So we can talk about the risk of an animal having something. And that could be mastitis, that could be ketosis, it could be lots of other things. But I think that notion helps us, helps us to begin to ask questions about how would we treat animals that have a risk down here? Are they worth treating? All those kinds of questions. Just to show you another example, so this is a cow, and again, remember the farmer had not seen the data before he called the vet, but immediately you can see this cow has had repeat cases of mastitis. Over here, the baseline is a little bit lower than over here. So when this risk thing is being calculated, it uses the cow's own baseline against which to judge if there is an event. And that's another advantage of these kind of detection systems. And I just wanted to show you how that looks when you take rather more than two examples, because it's a fairly easy trick, and we all use it. We show a nice graph that fits our story. There's always a whole bunch of horrible graphs that you never get to see. So this is showing for 600 lactations, roughly half of which were cows that had a mastitis treatment, and what I've done is I've lined up these, their risk relative to the day of treatment. And they're the ones with the open circles. So you can see there is an increase here. And then it drops off again. Compared to the black crosses, and those are another 300 lactations of animals that had no mastitis, that were perfectly healthy. So we're quite pleased because we can see a difference. And we can see that difference before the day of treatment. So a significant difference from four days before treatment on average. And that's quite a gain. This is the same graph, but this time instead of lining up to the day of treatment, I've lined up to the day of peak of the mastitis indicator. And now you can see it's a much more dramatic difference. And that tells us also that the time between the farmer actually identifying the cow and getting the vet to treat, and the animal being at its peak sickness varies between animals. And if you have this information, well then you can act more on where the cow is than on the final kind of clinical signs and when you call the vet. So early warning is possible, and early warning means you don't have to just be the fireman coming in to deal with a chronic clinical case, you can start to think about what you would do. What you would do in subclinical, and there's a whole area there which um, I think we're only beginning to scratch the surface of, 
And what would you do if you identified four days early? Is it simply go in and treat early? Or is it make some further testing to find out what's going on? One answer would be use that time to find out what the bacteria was that was, being, that was behind that mastitis alarm. And what you can see here is that these are just data for uh, a survey data in, in Denmark. And in 15% of cases, we're talking about coliform bacteria. In 19, 20% of cases, there's no growth. And then there are these 2% CNS. So 37% of these samples, there's no immediate need for therapy, antibiotics. So instead of thinking, oh, we can go in and treat everything early and wipe out, we can actually make selective treatment, which is better for antibiotic usage and all antibiotic resistance and so on, probably more economic. And we can also think about treatments that can come in early and have a better chance of cure rates. The same thing happens new opportunities if we go back to our reproduction and we ask questions like, when should we inseminate cows? Traditionally, you have a voluntary waiting period and then as whenever you see an estrus, the first estrus after that voluntary waiting period, you inseminate because you're not sure you're going to see another one. But if you detect all of your estruses, Obviously, you want to inseminate during estrus. But then the question is, which one? You could inseminate here, or here, or here, or here, and so on. Which of these is best? Best from the perspective of being likely to succeed, because some estruses are really not good. Or best from the perspective of what is this cow actually doing? If she's a massively high-yielding cow, and you inseminate her at day 90, let's say, you may end up drying her off at 20 kilos in milk. Is that not an animal where, if you could be sure you would see her subsequent estruses, you might decide to inseminate her later? So those are key questions which come up when you have that more complete information coming from precision livestock technologies. So we're talking here about something called likelihood of an AI succeeding. And there are now systems out there which can begin to give those kind of prognostics. So the, one of the key things is new diagnostic opportunities. Time is a big element. Time for early intervention. Time to react before you're putting out fires, but maybe think about preventing them before they start. Potential for better cure rates in that way. And then new thinking, degrees of infection, better targeted actions. So those are the things which I think are already there today. And I don't know if there are any questions at this point or we keep the questions for the end, something that's not clear. Feel free. Yeah, we could probably, probably pick them at the end unless there's anyone that's sort of burning questions now, but we can, we can certainly collect these up at the end as well, but happy to pick any meantime. But uh, I think we'll probably take them at the end, Nick, actually, if that's okay. okay. We'll probably pick them up together, but thank you. OK, so we're going to make um, one hugely important point before we move on. So I'm not sure this picture shows very well. This plank and the three guys standing here is one solution to allow him to go and paint the boat. It's not a particularly sustainable, robust, and useful solution. And that is also something you need to be very, very aware of with these technologies. There is a lot of potential technology. There are a lot of things which are very exciting and interesting. But there are a hell of a lot of ungrounded promises. This is, an, this is a market which is blossoming, and there are things coming every day. So be aware of ungrounded promises. And when we've looked at it, there is often surprisingly little or very weak testing. And that's because testing of these systems is actually much less fun than building them. It's also expensive, it requires independent reference measures, it's difficult to do, and of course people are rushing to market. So if you're in the advisor role, and we talked about this a little bit today, it would be nice to have a guide which technologies would be best, 
But I think which technology is useful for what is a good idea. And then to be very aware of when we're looking at technologies, what, what actually are they being able to tell us behind about the testing they've done on those technologies? Yeah, and beware of people like me showing you pretty graphs. There's always a bad one somewhere that's hidden. OK, so that was the first part. Kind of where are we now? What I want to do now is to come on to where are we going? Because these technologies not only allow us to pick up things that we've, we know we want to have, like uh, estrus or mastitis or things like that, but we can actually start to think about measuring more complex traits. And I'll start with an example about energy balance. Uh, so this fits very well with those who are on farm and body condition score. And then we'll go into a little bit where the future might be taking us, or at least one vision of that. And you may think when we're talking about the future and complex traits that we're talking about fantastically complex technologies. And this is a photo taken from a drone, which is part of a project looking at identifying animals at distance and working out their body volume and therefore their body weight. Fancy gadgetry could be very interesting. But actually, there are plenty of opportunities with some very simple, humble, which you probably wouldn't think of as precision livestock technologies, but the way crate. And I just want to highlight that, because a lot of what we can get, we can get from existing data. And we can get it because we use that old piece of technology in a way where we get frequent measurements. So we've been banging on as researchers and advisors for years and years and years about the importance of energy balance how cows which mobilize too much in early lactation, a big negative energy balance, it impacts health, it impacts fertility, it has impacts on efficiency. The only problem is that the only people who could actually measure energy balance on individual cows were researchers. Energy balance is kind of an arithmetic saying we take the amount of energy the animal has eaten, we subtract the amount of energy coming out, in milk or growth or maintenance or whatever, and we call that the energy balance. That implies measuring intakes, and measuring individual intakes on farms only happens in research farms, and even then, it's never particularly fantastic. But that's a kind of accountant's way of looking at energy balance. There's another way of looking at it. There's a biological way of looking at it. If an animal is eating less than it's putting out, that energy has to come from somewhere. It's coming from its body reserves, so it's losing body reserves. And the opposite, if it's eating more than is coming out, well, we all know what happens at Christmas time, it goes into body reserves. So maybe we can get at this in another way by looking at body energy change. In other words, can we measure the changes in body reserves if they're being mobilized, that's negative energy balance. If they're being put on, if they're being accreted, that's positive energy balance. And that turns out to be fairly doable. We can get at this measure from body reserves. So we come back to our humble way crate. I won't bore you with the details of this, but what's important down the bottom here is that in order to get this energy balance, we need these things that are in purple. We need the body weight of the animal, its body condition score, and we need to account for that part of its body weight, which is simply what's in its guts, what's in its rumen. And that was the thing that was kind of making it difficult beforehand. If you, if you weigh a cow one month and you weigh her a month later, part of that difference will be the difference in what she has in her guts. If, on the other hand, you weigh that cow at every milking as she comes out of the parlor, then you get this kind of graph. You can see all that noise here, which is related to whether she's just eaten or whether she hasn't eaten or so on, all of that gut fill. But you can see that we have the techniques to smooth that and get this nice underlying trend, and that is the part which is the energy balance, the change in her body reserves. So that means for individual animals, we can get this. We can get her energy balance through lactation. 
largely coming from her body weight. So the humble weight crate now gives us the chance to have this measure of energy balance, which we said was important for health and fertility, on real farms, provided they have a weigh scale on the way out of the milking parlour, with no need for intake. And that, for me, is a very, very simple example where a, an ordinary piece of technology used in a slightly different way can give us a substantial gain. And as we saw this afternoon, we now have also the body condition part of that because there are imaging technologies which allow us to get body condition score as well. So we can really do this on any farm which is prepared to provide some body condition scores and has frequent weigh-in. So what? Do we really need energy balance? Well, it turns out that when it comes to reproduction, the cow has been designed by evolution to not want to reproduce if she's likely to fail. So the cow has a view on the world around it, and that view comes from its energy balance. If the cow wants to answer the question, how bad is the environment? Is there food available or not? It turns out she uses the fact that she's losing body weight as an indicator. So the more negative energy balance, the poorer is her reproduction. Or rather, the more delayed is her reproduction, is usually the case. And if she's asking the question, can I cope in the future? Well, that's like an investment. If I have some reserves in the bank, if I have some body reserves, then the more I have, the more likely I am to cope if things get tough. So we have this effect. As body fatness goes up, reproduction becomes more likely. And that's been shown in studies. So this is an example from beef cattle. So here we have the change in condition score. As it becomes more negative, that's the same as a more negative energy balance. And here we have the days until these animals showed their first heat. And in the two cases, you can see that the more we move to this side, the longer it takes for those animals to come back into estrus. Here it's a an increase of 15 days. Here it's a very much longer increase. So these things are really impacting fertility. And if we know about the cow's energy balance, then we can help us to predict is it worth inseminating that cow now? And if we do, what are our chances of success? So things start to add up. We can take two simple technologies, put them together, and get a better prediction of whether we should go for an insemination or not. So that was one I would call low-hanging fruit example. And I now want to spend the last, I guess, 10 minutes or so, I'm not sure, something like that, on this project, Gentor. So you've heard this word all day, at least if you were in our session, and are probably sick of it. GENTOR stands for Genomic Management Tools to Optimize Resilience and Efficiency. Lots of big words. Where this is heading is that if we combine genomics with precision livestock, we're in a position to start to be able to make good predictions about where we go with our breeding and our culling strategies. And that, of course, can be helpful for the farmer in terms of his economic efficiency, but it's also going to have a huge impact on where the farm is going in terms of its environmental footprint. Because if you get your breeding right, you have exactly the right number of animals for what you want to do, you minimize having animals that, in the end, are either going to be very short-lived or have no direct purpose. And that has a huge impact on your carbon footprint. In order to do that, though, you need to get this right balance between the resilience, the ability of the animal to deal with challenges and difficult situations, and its efficiency, which, of course, is the bottom line for the farmer, being able to get a good return on his investment. So we need to measure those things. And the underlying biology is this. The animal eats food, which it converts into nutrients, which it absorbs. And then those nutrients can go in different places. We want them to go to production, because that's where we get our investment back. But they can also go to things like body reserves and maintenance. One way to increase efficiency 
is to select or manipulate animals so they push more and more of their nutrients down this trouser leg and get more milk, and then we get a higher efficiency, and that's called dilution of maintenance. So basically, this becomes a bigger proportion of the total. But if we do that, we're closing off what's going down here. So think back to what we've just said about body reserves and fertility. So we impact the animal's ability to reproduce and increase its likelihood of reproductive problems. We have a negative impact on its health status and increase its risk of disease. On all of those things are affecting the animal's likelihood of staying in the herd. They're affecting its well-being and its resilience. And that has an impact on efficiency, but in a different way. If you close down here and have these problems, you have animals leaving the herd earlier. So in the worst case, you've raised an animal from being a calf right through until she has been inseminated, had her first pregnancy, produces her first calf. So at that point, she has not produced one drop of milk. So her efficiency at that point is zero. It's only as she starts producing milk that she's actually increasing that calculation of efficiency. If she then fails to reproduce and leaves just after one lactation, you've invested an awful lot of time in her non-productive life to get a very short return. So if we can protect this longevity, resilience and well-being, we can increase efficiency by diluting that non-productive part of our lifespan. And that's a kind of balance that we're interested in gentle. How much effort should we put into getting more production relative to preserving the ability of these cows to go on, to fit with their environments, to deal with the challenges? So that's, that's the key question in this project. Can we find the harmony between efficiency and resilience? So what has that got to do with precision livestock farming? Well, if we want to make some kind of balance between these, we have to be able to measure them. And I'm just going to show you a couple of results from the project, which are very, just a simple, a small part of what we're doing, to actually look at how we can use PLF measures. So here, this is PLF measures to measure resilience indicators. This is the work of a group at Wageningen Research uh, with Marika Popper. And what they wanted to do was to find some indicator in the kind of data streams we've talked about, which would give us an idea of how resilient a cow is or not. And their idea was to take the daily milk records of an animal, and there are now many milking systems which give you daily records, get rid of the overlying lactation trend, that blue line, and what that leaves you with is all the noise around that lactation curve. And this the argument goes, represents all the times the cow got knocked off her perch, the times she had a disease challenge or a feed challenge, and how she reacted. And their argument was that this variability could be an indicator of resilience, could be an indicator of how good a cow is at coping. So what Marika did was to then go and find data this is using robotic milking herds. She managed to get hold of data from 200,000 cows, so was able to actually do a genetic analysis and show that this variance in milk yield was negatively correlated with other health and all kinds of health issues, hooth health, well, not hooth health, but ketosis. So that means the more variable this milk measure, the more likely the cow was to have other problems, ketosis, to have a shorter longevity, and so on. So this looks like a very easy way of getting at least one measure of resilience, simply from milk yield records. We're not making some kind of new bio-indicator with some new technology. We're using what's already there, but because it's frequent measures. The same idea was taken to go and look at efficiency. And one of the key things with efficiency is that it changes with time, and the methods for measuring efficiency that existed did not really take that into account. But because of PLF, if we have frequent measures, we can take that into account. 
So we've seen already in previous slides daily milk yields. We've seen daily body weight. If we have those things and intake, then we can calculate efficiency very frequently. Now, this is the missing technology at the moment. Measuring feed intake, there are systems to do it. They're very expensive, and generally you don't see them outside of research farms. But there are technologies which are just about ready to be used to make this possible, to have good estimates of intake on a daily basis for individual animals. So this is an example. These are colleagues working at Viking Genetics, and they have developed a system with cameras which film the cows and the feed bunk. And they can use that to identify which cow is feeding. And then you can see the color gradients here. They're measuring the volume of the feed bunk. So they can get, through image analysis, an estimate of how much food has disappeared for a particular cow. So this is technology which won't be very expensive because it's based on, on uh, imaging and cameras, things that now become very, very easily available. So we think that we're getting to the place where we could actually have efficiency measured for long periods of time on large numbers of animals. So within the project, some of our, my younger colleagues have worked on ways to use that in this kind of precision livestock farming context. And what you can see here is a measure of efficiency called RFI. And I'm not going to go into what that is, but it is a measure of efficiency. And you can see that it changes through lactation if you look at it relative to the overall lactation average. So if we get higher efficiency here, that doesn't necessarily mean we have it at the beginning or at the end. And what is more interesting is if you can have that on individual animals, like here, you can start to see animals, some of which have this RFI always high, some of which have it always negative. Those are the ones you actually want. And then you can see animals that start off very well but become poorer, or vice versa. And these are animals all on the same TMR feeding in the same herd. So there is variation between animals in this efficiency. So if we can measure that, if we can measure their resilience, we can start to ask questions about what kind of cow we want in this particular herd or that particular herd, depending on the feeding conditions, depending on the environment, and so on. We can skip that slide. Um, so I have whizzed through a couple of pieces of work done by Gentle scientists. I have not done them justice. If it interests you, then Gentle has a YouTube channel where you can find fuller presentations of these pieces of work. And the last stage in all of this is pulling it all together. If you know what kind of animals you have in terms of their productivity and efficiency, in terms of how fragile or resilient they are, then you can start to ask the questions, which animals do I want? And you can think about ranking them. You could make breeding and culling decisions based on that. If you know the genetics of those animals and from PLF, you know what they've done, where they've come from, how they're performing, you can start to decide in your herd, if it's a dairy herd, for example, which animals do I want to breed on dairy again for my replacements? I could maybe use sex semen, and then I would even reduce the number of animals I need to get my dairy replacements. I could go further down the list and say, OK, these animals here, they're not my star performers. They're not the genetics I necessarily want in my herd tomorrow. I can breed those off onto beef, to get a good beef cross on those. And then, of course, there's the bottom of the list. Well, those are the ones which potentially I'm going to cull. And, of course, how you make that ranking, how you make that balance between resilience and efficiency, I would suggest is a local decision, depending on where you are, what your markets are, what your feeding environment is. Now, that may sound like a pipe dream. But actually, this is an example of a system which does that in a simple way, brings in information about the cow's current lactation, its net culling worth and costs, what's predicted to do in future lactations. This is called the cow's own worth index. And this has actually now been launched in Ireland and is being used by a significant number of dairy farmers in Ireland to do just that, 
to use that tool to decide which animals they breed on for their dairy, which animals they cross off, and so on. And we are continually developing those tools to have more and more ability to help farmers make those kind of decisions. If they do that, they can have exactly the animals they want for the future. They avoid carrying animals that they're not going to really use because, well, we had to breed because we didn't know what would happen. Reduce those... They're not useless, but you reduce those spare animals, you reduce your carbon footprint for the same amount of total output of the farm. And I think that's an incredibly important thing in the light of all we've been listening to in the last few weeks with COP26 and so on. I talked about the challenges of data overload, the need for integrated solutions, and I think user-friendliness of these systems is very important for uptake. They must also be demonstrable value for money. There is another challenge. There is a risk of technology being perceived as a dehumanizing factor. Oh, we don't even need to go out and look at the cows. It's, it's all being monitored. It's all being steered. You might even have a system which inseminates them without us actually going out there. I'm not sure that's a good thing. We need to be very clear about these technologies. Even if they're to help us with our economy, they should also be something which helps us improve the well-being of our animals if we want them to have societal, societal acceptance. That's not an easy thing to say. So, lots of potential, but these challenges. And that brings me to my conclusions. PLF, time series measurements, they offer huge opportunities for the farmer, for the vets and advisors. They're absolutely not a threat to our livelihoods. They give us more information to make better informed diagnoses, to do better herd management. They're also a considerable opportunity for the researcher because we get more and more data. We can start to do some of the things that I showed you at the end, get data from 200,000 cows with daily milk records. That would have not been possible 30 years ago. And then, of course, before we go rushing our arms in the air like mad things, we need to remember that there are still some challenges about these large volumes of data and how to deploy this in an acceptable way. And I think that was it. So thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. First of all, a round of applause for Nick, I think. So thank you very much to, to Nick and pulling together a load of themes that actually we've talked about on farm today, you've talked about here today, uh, and again, they're going to come up tomorrow very much as well. I think we have time just for a couple of questions and we will kind of, we will finish around six actually in terms of timings for very importantly, nutrition um, and also liquid refreshment. Um, any, any questions from the floor? I've got to one. Richard. Oh, sorry. So I here, the roving mic. You sound out of practice today, so it's terrible. There you go, you. Richard. Um, <clears throat> when you referred to your trial, which I presume was to do with the navigator system, uh, where you had 99,000-ish results, was that on individual quarters with it being a robotic system? Uh, the, mast the mastitis one? Yes. No, it, was on, it, was on, it wasn't quarter level, no. And so was it on conductivity or was it on another... Me measuring system? The graphs I showed there were using, they measure an enzyme in milk called LDH, which is an enzyme produced in response to an inflammation. And is that an inline? Yep, that's an inline thing. System. Yep. So, yeah. so they have a system where they have samplers in place all the time, and can the, the system can order a sample for a particular cow and then it goes into uh, something very much like a lateral flow test, which you now all know and love. Uh, a couple of drops of milk, and then there is a color change. And that's, that's what's measuring how much enzyme there is for mastitis, or whether there's progesterone or not for the reproductive side. But that's just one system. You could, conductivity can be used to, to get pretty much the same kind of things. But that needs to then be looked at at quarter level. Yes, get the interquartile ratio. Well, we, we wrongly fitted conductivity on a pile and it was a waste of money, basically, because it was testing all four quarters and it wasn't yep. specific enough. Yep, <coughs> yep, yep. It's, it's conductivity is an example, I think, where uh, it was better than nothing, 
but because it wasn't at the right level, it, it then created a lot of false positives. And you really needed to go that step further and have the comparison between the best and the worst quarters, for example. Um, yep, yeah, totally agree. And just on that same theme then, so how about the progesterone testing? Can, is that on an inline monitoring system as well, measurement? Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to do the advert for Herd Navigator, but if, if you go to Herd Navigator, you get both of those things in the same package and ketosis as well. Um, yeah. And the body condition scoring then, does that, it monitors body condition scores, does it, does it look at fat levels within the animal? Or is it, look, I saw that picture with all those pretty colours on, but does it, yeah. what, what's that showing you? The, all, all of the condition scoring systems are taking an image of the back of the cow and they're doing basically what you or I would do with our eye or with our hand and trying to work out how much fat cover there is on the bones, whether that's the processes on the, on the spine or the, or the tail bones. Um, yeah. So that's just an image analysis of the same thing that, that we look at. And presumably that's calibrated against a visual... Yes, that's been calibrated against yeah. people who are seen as being reference scorers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The interesting thing with that, we talked about that today, is lots of different people have different scales, but the, once it's been calibrated, what it means is it's always on the same scale. So even if that scale is perhaps a little bit off in true, if you were to grind up the cow and measure the fat, which I don't suggest you do, <laughs> what you then get are the changes, and it's the changes which become important relative to where she was you know, two months ago or or how much she's dropped since the beginning of lactation, or is, it, is she coming up too fast at the end of lactation? Those are, I think those are it's the changes which are important in those systems. Especially that last one that you mentioned about yep. them going up too fast and yep. knowing when to pull, pull feed off low yep. yields. Yeah, yep. pull feed off or dry off. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and we had discussion around that at Shun Farm today because we looked at an automated system on body condition scoring you know, we're just looking at options for, you know, for that too, so. Um. In terms of lameness then, how good are these, because I've heard varying reports on how good they are, these, these systems for measuring whether a cow is lame or not? Um, I'm not up to date on the latest there. The ones that I was involved with, they would have been good if you could get cows to walk in a standard way. At a standard speed. <laughs> does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> they need retraining. So, so it, it, it was one of the things when they started looking at accelerometers, people thought, oh, we should be able to get lameness. This should be a no-brainer, you know, because you've got all of the movements of the animal. But in fact, if the cows start running or they stop and start, or they, it's, it, if you could get a constant gait then you could measure all those things well. But it turns out to be much more difficult than we thought. So it's not impossible, and the systems are getting better and better. Um, but the last time I looked, that was one of the harder challenges. It was actually easier to use accelerometers to get rumination than it was to get reliable lameness detection. But that may have changed in the last few years. So target, just, just one last one, different issue, methane reduction. So uh, products I'm aware of are seaweed, and um, the... Um, no, the, oh, the, men, yeah, menensin yeah, as well. Menensin, yeah. so yeah, so yeah, yeah. Mind block, memory block. So have you done any trials, with you being involved in the thing, have you done any trials along those lines to see what, what's what? Not directly, no. Um, I have colleagues working on that and looking at the composition of the bugs in the room and, and all that stuff. Um, the calculations say that on a farm level, the biggest way to reduce those things is by what we were just talking about, making sure that you, you, for the amount of product you have, you have the minimum number of animals. And, and, and that's, the, that's the kind of the, 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 the big and easy gain. I'm not saying some of these other things don't work. Uh, I think some of them are getting to the place where they do start to work. Um, but the, but the big gain is, is in reducing that sort of surplus carry that we see because we needed that insurance. You know, if, if the technology means we can have, get, get away with a smaller buffer of animals, then we gain immediately on that, on that footprint. So that, that's where I would look first.
Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Richard. So let me put time for one sort of swift additional question. So, Mike, and then we'll probably will wrap up at that. So, Sean, um, it's not a question. It's an observation, actually, Jonathan. Um, Nick, it's been really interesting because many of the things you've talked about this evening have been reflected in some of the presentations we've had here today. And, and two of the things that have really struck me th through all of today has been how do we take some of this really detailed stuff and get it through to the guy on the farm to make help him make different decisions and the important role of you know the vet or uh, other advisors in that process and the second thing you know you mentioned right at the end which is an entire conference topic for itself <laughs> it's so that that societal acceptance and societal drivers we've been talking yeah. around this afternoon which i think we'll cover uh, in some of the uh, uh, debate we have tomorrow afternoon i think it's a really critical uh, factor if we're if we're going to stand up to society's uh, um, requirements how, how we get it out there on farm I think for some things, it, you know, people, farmers are really asking. So heat detection, I mean, most farmers, most dairy farmers now have already invested in some form of technology because they had a real issue there. They were looking, they were desperate for an answer. The other way in is to show with advice what can be benefits, what can be add-on benefits. So I think that's why I was trying to hammer that, you know, what are the opportunities here? If, if, if you can show that mastitis treatment can become more targeted, therefore potentially cheaper, with fewer losses, that starts to sell the benefit beyond just, I can now see when a cow has mastitis. Or going, if, if, if we're going to go for the whole picture, go to the very end and say, imagine what would happen if you could rank your animals on your criteria in terms of, you know, and, and then how you, would, how you would work with that. So that, I think that's a, just a dialogue that comes from the advisors, whether they're vets or other kinds of advisors, and, and to draw out those benefits, those potential benefits. We also talked today about some of the issues with inevitably some of these new technologies, and they do cost, and they cost less on bigger farms simply because of economies of scale. And it would be an awful shame if precision livestock technology ended up being something which helped accelerate the push towards larger farms. There is a credible dialogue about the role of small farms in lots of different areas, maybe not in beautiful fertile areas, but in marginal areas. We don't want to lose that. And the same with you know, extensive farming situations. A lot of these technologies are very convenient indoors, they're much more complicated outdoors. And, and so that needs, to be, that needs to be looked at as well, I think. Thank you, Nick. So um, with, uh, with literally some food for thought, again, sort of wrapping up today, some of these themes, again, are going to be explored in slightly different ways tomorrow. And as Mike said, we're actually kind of bringing tomorrow to a close with a panel session looking at actually the, the links with big tech and the big tech companies together with actually the kind of livestock sector and how we can see how we can integrate those things together. So I, I want to say, first of all, a big thank you again to Nick for all of today and actually this talk particularly now. So thank you, Nick. We appreciate that. Um, and thanks to Nick actually for all the groundbreaking work that he's done in this sector in bringing kind of this innovation to practical farming. It's really important. Um, but also want to say a big thank you to, to the tech team here today who have navigated um, international um, and all sorts of barriers, particularly the barriers of being in Yorkshire, which you know can be can be quite big. So thanks guys, you're doing a great job. So well done. We we had on a rural Yorkshire farm a live QA between Nantucket, you know, kind of in much and 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 near Toronto in Canada and obviously the global centre that is Yorkshire. So it doesn't get any better than that, which is pretty cool. Um, but also a thank you to, to basically to all the RAF team who've done the organisation here you know, today, and to our sponsors, because without their support in these really challenging times, we massively appreciate the backing from all the sponsors here today. It's been really important because 
actually there's real challenges with kind of bringing together things in COVID conditions. And of course, last but not least, thanks to all of you. Um, it's great to have you here attending. Thank you for coming. Tomorrow's going to be really exciting too, but now it's dinner time. 